Welcome to the We Are Libertarians Libertarian Presidential Candidate Debate Series. Uh, I am Hody Johns. I am your host. I am joined here with, uh, you know him, you love him. This is Arvin Vora. Arvin, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Excited to be on. Appreciate you guys setting this up and having me on. Yeah, uh, our second time doing this. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, about half of them I've spoken to him before, I ha half of them I haven't, but you can find uh, Arvin and me talking about his book, which I finally got around to reading, by the way, uh, pull out. Uh, awesome book, highly recommended. Awesome, uh, appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, no, it's great. I am. Um, I was excited to see it up there on the what political books, libertarian books. How, however, it was uh, mm -hmm. it was nice to see that climb in the chain. I'm sure you're happy about that as well. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's terrible when you're the only one who reads a book and you want to talk to people about it. But yeah. <laughs> uh, so so let's get right into it. Um, mm -hmm. We're asking the same question of all the presidents, just so we can do, or all the presidential candidates, just so we can do an apples mm -hmm. to apples comparison to everybody, so that they know where you stand on the issues and. Sure. Of course, you'll be invited to many debates and different forums, and we'll give you the, the hardball questions later, but uh, let, this is just so that we know what uh, President Arvind Vora would look like. So sure. first things first, every other question is political. So okay. aside from this first one, just tell us about yourself. Who are okay. you, what you do, occupation, family, whatever you think is important outside sure. of your political life. Uh, sure. I mean, a lot of it's tied into my libertarian journey. Uh, mm -hmm. I am an entrepreneur. I founded my own education business uh, when I was 22. Uh, you know, I'm 39 now, so it's been in business and it's grown and changed. So I've really been very fortunate to be involved in a business where I'm free to innovate constantly. You know, we can bounce ideas off each other, come with new and better ways of doing things. And what's amazing about being able to be an entrepreneur in, in an unregulated area is that you can really try out new great ideas all the time. And I would say that from year to year, even month to month, our business isn't even the same. It so quickly changes. We don't stagnate, we constantly change. Um, and that, that to me is something that I would like to see a lot more people have the opportunity to do. It's something that I think a lot more people can do or would do if they weren't, you know, hamstrung by government. I'm sure we'll get get into that later. Sure. I'm also an author. I've written several books. Uh, some of them have been published internationally. Some of them haven't. Uh, pull out because of its incendiary content. I'm not. I'm not waiting for it to be published in China anytime soon. However, my book, The Equation for Excellence: How to Make Your Child Excel in Math, that was published both in the, here and and abroad in China. So you know, I've I've had some some reach in, in that type of areas, uh, and those types of areas. Um, what's, what really drives me both in a, in a personal sense is a pursuit of both freedom and a pursuit of excellence. That's why I dedicate myself to education. I think education is the most important part of any society, any culture, however you define education, but, but what shapes us to be better than what we are, to me, that's the center of all of it. And I really would like to see a world in which government wasn't involved in education so that it could thrive and be better the way that government free areas are. Yeah, I actually got, uh, and I was a bit of a nerd. I got mediocre to good scores in math, but then I got like a perfect score on my ACT in math. And I was like, well, nice. apparently I'm better at it than my teachers seem to think I am at it. Anyway. That often does happen. <laughs> yeah. So let's, uh, uh, let's bleed right into it. Let's get your libertarian journey. What, where did you start? I find nobody's really native to it. Everybody seems to get there. So how did you get there? Uh, I got there earlier than most people. Uh, you know, I, I at, a, at a very young age, I wanted something that was what I thought the, the, the Republicans said they were about economically and what Democrats said they were about socially. A friend of mine told me about the Libertarian Party. And, and that made me a Libertarian, but maybe more nominally. What really changed that what made me more active was seeing how much damage government does to education. And I wanted, you know, because of the way that my business is, we work with students from public schools and private schools, homeschool, all these different methods of education. And I wanted to be able to stop the damage that government is doing to the younger generations, that it continues to do, that continue to have repercussions on people as they grow up. I wanted to be able to stop that damage. And that damage comes from government. To me, getting government out of education, ending all government schools, all government subsidized schools, all government regulated schools, all government funded schools, to me, that is 
one of the most important things that we can do to improve the United States. I want education today to be what the tech sector was. I want it to be a place that has great and innovative jobs, creates all these choices for people, where people have a million different choices of the kind of education that works for them. I want true free market education with no government involvement of any kind. And so that to me was what really transformed me from, you know, the kind of passive, just, you know, I called myself a libertarian, but didn't really do anything about it. to someone that became much more passionate. To me, getting government out of education is one of my number one goals. Gotcha. That's kind of the driving force behind your journey was, was seeing how much better people were with the government outside of it, mm -hmm. how much better it would be with entrepreneurship. Awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that kind of leads right into my next question. We're going to go one, two, three. We're going to talk okay. about your priorities as president, the biggest mm -hmm. problems you see facing the country, uh, what they are, and how you would fix them. So problem number one, what's the top of the list? I, I think based on your previous answer, I might know, but, uh, but, but hit, us with, hit us with it. Um, that education tax is not my number one. My number one is the income tax. I think we need to get rid of it entirely. And that needs to be achieved by cutting spending, dismantling most government departments, if not all, and just get ending the federal income tax entirely. Uh, ending the federal income tax, it's great for people domestically because it encourages people to actually work and it, it gives you that great incentive. But as our economy becomes more global, it's actually much more critical. We're already seeing record numbers of people leaving the United States, abandoning their citizenship to go to places with lower taxes. At the same time, you know, you think back to when the Rolling Stones left England because they wanted lower taxes. They, came, they became American citizens. You know, that's what I want to see. I want to see the best, the brightest, you know, the artists, the innovators, the engineers, the doctors, all the great people, the, the, the people who are great in a way that, that maybe they don't, they don't know yet, but are going to be doing something amazing. I want those people to come to the United States. And so to me, ending taxes is not just about what we're doing here, but actually about making immigration better. I want to attract the people who want no taxes. And at the same time, I want to make it easy for people who don't want to be part of a no tax country I want to make it easy for them to join another high tax country if that's what they want. So, so my number one goal is to end the income tax by cutting government spending. That's, that's, that's a great goal. It's almost juxtaposes with the, or goes hand in hand with like kind of cutting down on some of the welfare programs that libertarians talk mm -hmm. about. It's like, we don't want them coming here because of free money, but we do want them coming here for their money, you know, mm -hmm. for, for what they yeah. actually contribute. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, problem number two, what do you think it is and how would you address it? Education. Okay, there you go. And, and, and to me, that's something that can be addressed to, to a certain extent, the federal level by ending the Department of Education, uh, by, and that especially, that includes not just the part that deals with secondary education, but ending the federal student loan program. The federal student loan program has allowed colleges to get away with murder, charging exorbitant tuition that don't make any kind of sense. If you attend a private college in America, you're paying over $100 an hour to sit in a lecture. Now, I work in high-end private education, and I've never seen anything that charges $100 an hour to sit in a long-term lecture. I'm not talking about a one-off thing. You're seeing you know, some famous person speak, but to go to a lecture week after week, three times, three, four, five times a week, paying 100 bucks an hour, that's absurd. And that's allowed by the federal student loan program. I will I'll end it. It needs to go completely. So that's another major part of something that's handled by the Department of Education, and it's one of the things that needs to go. So I'm going to be ending that. Uh, secondary education, primary education, that's, that's usually handled at the state level. However, however, there are ways that a president can help with that. Simple example, if a student, if a family is choosing to homeschool and doesn't want to fill out the paperwork, they get in trouble with their state, the president can pardon them. And I will absolutely preemptively and postemptively pardon every single person who breaks any of the quote truancy laws. To me, only the parent, the families, the individuals, are those the people who should be making all of the educational decisions. So I'll use the power of the presidency in every way that I can to really end government funded and government subsidized, government regulated and government run education. It'd be nice to see pardons used on 
uh, good parents as opposed to uh, what political allies that have helped donate to your campaign. It would be it would be a nice change to see. Um, all right, uh, thir- third and final problem. Well, obviously not final problem, but but your uh, what's what's your bronze medal of problems and and how do you go about it? Uh, U.S. foreign policy: the idea that we're still acting as the policemen of the world, the idea that we are essentially providing socialist Europe free military protection in exchange for basically nothing. That kind of stuff is just stupid. We don't gain any safety by being allied with France. France does gain safety by being allied with us. And what we're doing is we're basically in a one-sided military alliance where we just end up paying a bunch extra, having many more American men and women get, get either maimed or killed, psychologically damaged, because Europe doesn't want to or just as maybe they do want to but they found that they don't need to provide their own edu- their own uh, military defense because we're foolish enough to provide it for them uh, this is actually having in addition to the, the massive negative primary consequences of killing people overseas of damaging people at home of wasting money of misdirecting resources in addition to those primary effects it's having negative secondary effects in most countries uh, the military tends to be largely done, l- largely staffed by men, not 100%, but largely. And as what we're seeing in Europe is essentially what I consider to be human rights violations happening constantly. And it, to me, it's, a, it's, a, it's a indicative of a culture that is basically realized that it doesn't need men to do men things because the United States is doing it for them. In Germany and France, for example, things like paternity testing have been banned. The reason has been that in order that if you feel a lot of people do paternity tests, some of them might find out that they're not the father and might not want to provide, which obviously is the point of a paternity test. Yeah. That kind of stuff, those are secondary consequences of America providing the military protection for other countries. So. The primary effects are more than enough. The secondary effects by themselves, in my opinion, would probably also be enough. And so I'm going to bring the, all the troops home. I'm going to shut down all foreign bases, seize any involvement in, the, in this kind of like world policing type stuff. That type of foreign policy doesn't make any sense anymore. And I will absolutely shut that down. That saves us a pretty penny, as well as fix a lot of the problems. Like you, you talked about the secondary and tertiary effects of these problems, even, even problems for other countries. Um, all right, so let's take a step back from the presidency. We're, we're starting from the presidency, we're gonna work back. Let's say okay. you've achieved the nomination for the Libertarian Party and we're going against whoever the Democrats put up and probably Donald Trump, but whoever the Republicans put up. Sure. Um, if you get every single Libertarian and every single one shows up to the booth, you're gonna get like 16%. And that's just not gonna cut it. And that's if all of them show up and we get really mm-hmm. lucky. So mm-hmm. let's... Let, how do we, how do we, we're going to work on questions where we hit the goal by pulling from some of those other parties. Okay. Sure. So let's say I'm a social liberal. I'm really concerned about the disparity between uh, the relationship with police. I'm concerned about the relationship between um, whites and minorities. I'm concerned about, you know, handicap, handicap access, all of those so, uh, social justice, all of those things. Mm-hmm. Why would I consider your presidency instead of what the Democrats have to offer? Sure. So chances are, if you are a strong believer in government-funded social welfare, I mean, you probably won't. However, if your concern is more the kind of government abuse that goes on, which to me is far more significant than, than you know, any minor benefit that people might perceive from social welfare programs, then you're going to want to take my campaign very seriously. And here's why. Number one, I've, pr- I've already pledged publicly in the media, on Facebook, everywhere, that on my very first day, I'm going to pardon uh, Ross Ulbricht, Edward Snowden, uh, and Julian Assange, as well as all nonviolent drug offenders, all nonviolent drug users, all nonviolent drug you know, kingpins, that's people like Ross Ulbricht. All these people who aren't doing anything to anyone, I'm going to pardon all of them. The simple fact is the war on drugs has been used to be a war on minorities. There's no question in my mind on that. And what we're seeing now. Uh, in my opinion, is more evidence that the government is basically doing its best to maintain the class social structure. What we've seen, if you compare how they've dealt with marijuana laws 
and uh, the way they dealt with the Wall Street bailout. Yeah. When bankers fail to do their jobs and put the economy into a tailspin, in rather than letting them, you know, starve or you know have to take their kids out of private school or you know do something, the government bailed them out because it's these are the upper class and we want to make sure they stay the upper class. At the same time today, you have all these marijuana sellers in prison, many of them, many of whom are minorities. Yeah, they're not the ones who are reaping the benefits of this marijuana boom. The people who are getting the benefits of the marijuana boom through careful regulation and all kinds of stuff are again people who are already upper class. And what we see is there's no question that government is working to actively maintain that class structure. If you want to see that somebody who just doesn't care about overturning the class structure, that's me. I will not allow the government to keep doing that. That's why I'm going to have blanket pardons and why I simply will not under any circumstance allow any bailouts. If you were rich and you got used to a certain lifestyle, and then you were incompetent, now you're gonna be poor. That's how the free market is supposed to work. If you do things poorly or incompetently, you get poor. And that's what should have happened to all those Wall Street bankers. They should all be on the streets right now. If I'd been president at that point, at that time, they would be on the streets right now. Unfortunately, I wasn't, and what happened, they kept doing what they were doing. Uh, they did some of the same damaging things later on intentionally. Many people suggest that Goldman Sachs actually did what it did accidentally in America on purpose later on in Greece. We're rewarding bad behavior and that absolutely needs to stop. If you want to see an end to a government enforced class structure, I am your candidate. Awesome. That is something I think even just by freeing them, I think 93% of the federal incarcerated people are victimless crime. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a lot of families reunited. If you think about yeah. it, I haven't considered it that way that you're really replacing, you're saying, you know, cause people say, Oh, we legalize drugs, but you got to jump through all these hoops and those hoops really ref really are easy to go through. If you're the established, I I'm able to hire lawyers. I'm able to mm -hmm. do this paperwork. It's a, uh, that's a unique take. I like that. Um, all right, let's let's talk to the other side of the social spectrum. Let's talk about the social conservatives. Mm -hmm. Let's say we're concerned about, you know, my church had to take down its cross because it's visible from a highway. Um, mm -hmm. I'm concerned about the attack on traditional marriage. I don't like, I, I, I don't like, you know, I'm, I'm scared of kind of immigration issues and thinking they're taking, well, I guess sure. the jobs thing, we're going to address the economy part later. But just as far as the social issue goes, okay. when you're social conservative, you're scared about your traditional way of living, your culture. Mm -hmm. What would you say to, the, to those people is why they should support you instead of, say, Donald Trump? I think it's really important to distinguish from act, actual traditions from made up traditions. Uh, when we talk about marriage, government run marriage is a new phenomenon. It is not the traditional way. It's not how the founding fathers were married. It's not how people for thousands of years were married. Government doesn't belong in marriage at all. I believe that if your church is willing to do a marriage, then that's up to your church. Or if your secular organization, that's up to them. I don't believe that government should be involved in that at all. Uh, when it comes to freedom of expression, you know, if you want to put a cross or a burning cross or whatever, that should be your right. Now, if you put a bunch of racist stuff in front of your business and your business goes out of business, you know, don't come crying to me because there will not be any bailouts of any kind. If you were rich and made a weird decision and now you're poor, well, now you're poor. That's just how it is. Um, one of the big areas, and this is an area where I do disagree with the former presidential candidate, Gary Johnson, is the question of requiring businesses to provide services. I don't believe in that at all. I believe that if you want to refuse service to anyone for any reason, whether it's a good reason or it's kind of a silly reason, or maybe something that I think is a stupid reason, you think is a good reason, whatever, that's your right. It's your business. Provide what you want with that business. As an entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur myself, I know what it means to run a business. You put everything of yourself into it. You put your heart and your soul. And if somebody says, use these skills that you've built and developed to do something that you don't agree with, that to me is a, is a very personal violation, and I would not stand behind that by that at all. If you are a social conservative and you want to refuse to provide a particular business, and you do and you get in trouble for it, I'm going to pardon you right away. If, you, if it's a racist reason that I disagree with, that's not, that's not your problem. That's my problem if I disagree with it. You, as long as you do not hurt anybody or steal from anybody, 
I'm going to have your back and I'll pardon you immediately. You will not even have to enter or you, maybe you need to get into the courtroom before I can pardon you. But as soon as I can legally pardon you, I'm going to pardon you. And so that is, is to me my message social conservatives. The second part of that is most social conservatives, not all, but most deeply believe in personal and individual responsibility. And that is something that we share, that is something that I'm willing to absolutely fight for. So I wanna end the welfare state. I don't think it has any, any business in a free market. That's why I want to return complete control of education to families. Again, I don't think that government should be involved in family decision-making. Awesome. Let's go, let's flip it. Let's talk about the economic side. So okay. let's say I'm, I'm of a liberal mindset and I just really am, I, I hate seeing these big fat cats get their tax breaks. And yet here we are picking at uh, uh, food stamps. I, I'm concerned about the split it seems to be growing between the uber wealthy and, and the, you know, the haves, the have nots. And I just want to see this, this gap kind of get closer together. I might like what the Democrats are saying right now. Why is it that you would be better for me than what they would offer me? You know, I've, I've spoken to, you know, of course, living here in Maryland, right outside of DC, it's something that I hear a lot. And there are two motivations for it. Sometimes it's just jealousy. You know, I'm jealous of that person. He has more than me. That to me is a low emotion. It is something that all people struggle with. I'm not saying I've never been jealous of anybody in my life. Of course I have, just like everybody has. But I recognize that as a character deficiency and it's not something that I allow to guide my politics. If you feel jealousy, that's, that's fine. But if you base all your actions on jealousy, that to me is selling yourself short. You know, we can all be better than that. We're all gonna feel jealousy, but we can all choose not to act on it. But when I really talk to people about this, it's not usually jealousy. It's not, not maybe one in a hundred times, maybe one in a thousand times. Most of the time, it's the unfairness of it. And there's a lot of unfairness that goes on. Why should a billionaire football team owner get taxpayers to build him a stadium? I don't think he should. Why should one big powerful company get tax breaks that other people don't? I don't think they should. Now, the solution, of punishing everyone equally, I don't think that's a great solution. I don't think that what we need to be doing is saying, you know, this person has to pay, you know, I have to pay 20% taxes, so this person should also have to do it. What I say is if that person's paying no taxes, you should also pay no taxes. You know, somebody asked Ron Paul once that, you know, he said that, you know, 50% people of people don't pay any federal taxes, what do you think about that? And he said, we're halfway there. And that's how I feel. I don't want to add more taxes to the wealthy. I want to remove all taxes from the not wealthy. And the special privileges that we see government handing out, I want to end those special privileges. Those are morally wrong. Those are unfair. They're unjust. They have no place in any kind of a decent society. My way of doing that is not to give everybody special favors, but give nobody special favors. I want government to be so small that it cannot give anybody unfair special favors. Listen, you and I, all the people listening to this, we're not the people getting the special favors. We should be fighting against those special favors, not by saying, take away the tax breaks from the wealthy, but by saying, give tax breaks to everyone. As somebody who wants to end the income tax, obviously, that is one of my major priorities. You'd rather see an equality in freedom as opposed to an equality in punishment. You know, I think yeah. that's, 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 a, that's a much better uh, system of messaging there. Uh, flip it over to the Republican uh, economic side now. Mm -hmm. I am, I hate the fact that everybody's attacking my boss and trying to extort them. I don't like the size that the government has gotten to. I'm still concerned about defense and I really want to make sure that we still have that intact. But it just seems like the big, like big government keeps growing and growing. Why is it maybe you would be better than say Donald Trump, who, who we're probably gonna get from the Republicans. Sure, when it comes to fiscal conservatism, it's, it's gonna be very difficult to find somebody that's a stronger believer in fiscal conservatism than I am. My goal is to cut federal spending by about as much as possible. I wanna cut federal spending in every way, in all ways, as long as it's something that doesn't, the federal government doesn't absolutely need to be doing, I'm gonna end it. And so if, if your goal is fiscal conservatism, you're not gonna, I mean, Trump is not trying to end the income tax. He's not trying to cut spending. He's been increasing spending the way other presidents have. 
I'm going to cut spending to the ground. Yes, I will be laying off a lot of federal workers. You know, that's, that's part of it. And you know what? That's going to actually help the economy a lot because those people, they're not idiots. They're hardworking. Some of them are hardworking and the rest can become hardworking. The reason that I know this is I grew up with two parents, both of whom were civil servants yeah. and both of whom left and then became hardworking. I've seen the beauty of it in action. I grew up with that. It's an incredible transformation to see someone turn from a stifled bureaucrat to somebody who's passionate and hardworking and excited. I mean, that's the kind of changes that I want to see. I do want to address one thing for Republicans because this is something that comes up a lot, and that's the immigration issue. I am somebody that believes in open borders and no welfare, and that scares the hell out of a lot of Republicans. And I want to address that right now. We already have a system of open borders. Detroit is about as dangerous as any part of Mexico. And anybody from Detroit who wants to can go right now to Beverly Hills or Palm Beach. However, the rental prices caused by the free market make that an unlikely move to happen. The only people who move from places like Detroit to, to Palm Beach or Beverly Hills are, are you know, rap superstars like Eminem. I mean, it's not a very common thing to happen. Mm -hmm. Today, we have a problem with immigration, but it's not an immigration problem, it's a welfare problem. We have people coming to America for welfare. There's no question about it. That's why I want to end the welfare state. I want people like the Rolling Stones immigrating to America the way they did. I want Dyson to immigrate to America. I want every great entrepreneur to immigrate to America. And I know a lot of people say, well, if all these smart people come here, isn't that going to threaten our jobs? No. It's going to prevent your company from going out of business. Detroit already tried the thing about making sure that great skilled engineers from other countries didn't come over there, and they didn't, and the whole thing failed. When they blocked foreign labor, and Detroit successfully blocked foreign labor, in fairness, they, they said no foreign labor here, and they got their wish, and then they lost everything. We are in a global economy. That means we need the best workers here. My first step in immigration, by the way, in addition to, of course, working on the welfare state, yes. is to just get rid of the H-1 visa cap. Those are skilled workers. Those are the people that help companies survive. Like your IT guy, the computer programmers, the engineers that help your company continue to exist those are the people that I want to bring over here. And that's when I want to get rid of the H1 cap entirely. They're not going to threaten your job. They're going to prevent the companies you work at from going out of business. And so I know that immigration can be scary. Trust me on this. The way that I approach immigration is much more about bringing over the best and brightest. I'm not trying to bring it over a bunch of welfare leeches. In fact, there's not anybody who hates welfare more than I do. Sure. Well, I mean, if you ax welfare, it's kind of tough to take that incentive anymore, isn't it? That is true. <laughs> All right. So we're going to take a step back now. We're done. Mm -hmm. uh, but even before we've made the, uh, the nomination, let's try to go through your own primary there. Let's talk about the primary within the Libertarian Party and appealing mm -hmm. to all those guys. So we got a lot of different factions. I'm just gonna break them down into kind of the four big ones right now, just okay. so a little easier, but I, I know you know a thing or two about the factions. Um, let's, let's start with the left, the, the Libertarian Socialists, the Mutualists, you know, Mike Shipley, Sam Coppinger, uh, Matt Kino, you know, that, that type of, of mentality where they say, you know, I'm still Libertarian, I still believe in a voluntary society. I'm just not really, I really want to see the power come back to the people and get away from corporatism and from fat cats. And what would you say to like the libertarian socialists who, who you know, ha have a contingency within the party? Sure. I, actually, before I say anything to the libertarian socialists, I want to say something to the people that be, are, have, are taking so much issue with them. We have allowed socialism, regular socialism, not what the libertarian socialists, I'm going to talk about what they believe in a second. I'm talking about regular, what the average person thinks of social. We've allowed that by saying that it's okay to believe in government schools in this party. If you believe in universal government funded education, you can't get mad when Matt Keenel believes in universal government funded healthcare. It's the same thing. They're both socialists. I oppose both of them. However, when it comes to true libertarians, there is such a thing as libertarian socialism. And that is that individuals buy a private property and share their wealth and do whatever they want with it. To me, that's fine. That's perfectly fine. Now, often you see people who pretend they only believe in libertarian socialism start to believe in state socialism right away. That's where we need to say no level of state socialism is okay. 
You cannot say government schools are okay and then get mad when people say this other type of state socialism is okay. No state socialism, no welfare statism of any kind is okay. I will fight every part of it tooth and nail. I have been fighting every part of it tooth and nail. I fought it so hard that individual state parties, individual caucuses, when I was vice chair, even called for my resignation on account of messaging related to my desire to get rid of government schools. Other issues also came up. Those are separate things, and we can certainly get into those if you want. But one of the big issues was the government schools issue. When I was in Connecticut, which is a little bit more, you know, it's more of a blue state. When I was in Connecticut talking about ending government schools, the amount of backlash I got in that room of just libertarians blew my mind. That mindset must change. Libertarian socialists, if your goal is to share your own wealth and have your own mutualist societies, you know what you need? You need an end of property taxes. Because if you don't have an end of property taxes, that libertarian socialist mindset is never gonna happen. I am working to end all taxes. And part of ending property taxes is ending what the property taxes pay for, which is by and large government schools. I wanna end all government schools. I wanna end all property taxes. Some of those are state things that I can't do directly, but I can certainly encourage other people to do it and use various techniques. And Trump has shown us how, how a creative president can use a lot of various techniques to make things happen. And I'm gonna be doing that for every level of taxation. Awesome. Uh, let's, talk, let's move over to the libertarian right, uh, kind of the capitalists, ANCAPs, you got the Mises Caucus. Uh, Michael Heiss, Joshua Smith, you know, some of those guys who just, uh, Tom Woods, Eric July, uh, the guys that relate more to the right side of capitalism that kind of see a little bit of a threat from the social justice warrior movement, but they really are, are concerned about economy. Um, why would you be a better candidate for them than one of the other libertarians they might consider? I mean, that one's going to be kind of maybe almost too easy. You know, I'm a pretty hardcore, outspoken, unapologetic ANCAP, and there's, there's no question about that. Uh, even though in public appearances, I message to a minarchist, minarchist level because I believe in putting forth a message that we can all agree on. I believe I'm an ANCAP. I put ending welfare as one of my top priorities. Ending the income tax is my top priority. So... You know, if you want something that's unapologetically ANCAP, who's going to push those issues, who's going to make the debate about those issues, then I'm your guy. Great. Um, let's, one more uh, extreme faction of the party. Let's just talk about the outright an anarchists. The, mm -hmm. Some of them even have a problem voting at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but they just are, they, they want to see the government gone, the state gone, the majority of their concerns with libertarian candidates are that they just want to do the state run their way. Well, yeah. How would you message it to them to say, no, this is about decreasing or eliminating the state as opposed to just doing the state right? I mean, I think I've proven my credibility with them. You know, they, there's, you know, a lot of people in the, in the hardcore anarchist movement, they get tired of libertarians being, you know, what they call bootlickers, you know, constantly kowtowing to the various symbols and sacred cows of the state. I've made it clear that I'm not backing down from a group just because it's popular. I've said it clearly and I'll say it again now in case anybody's forgotten that at this time in history, it is not moral to join this country's armed forces because what they're doing is immoral. At this time in history, it is not moral to join this country's police in any state in the United States because what they're doing is immoral. Being a police officer today is immoral. It is morally wrong. It is not moral at this time in history to be a government school teacher. Joining, working at a government school is morally wrong. And I've said that, and that's a level that most libertarian candidates haven't gone to in the past. It's a reason that I myself have often been kind of lukewarm about some, some libertarian candidates in the past. If we are going to change government, we have to change culture. The simple fact is that this culture that we have today, this culture right now, has produced this government. And if we got rid of this government right now, this culture would recreate this exact government. And I know a lot of people say there's no way they would do that. They already just did that. During the shutdown, we got rid of a small little part of government and both the left and the right, everyone clamored to bring it back. This culture, if we get rid of government, will demand its return. 
we have to change this culture. And I am the person who will fight that cultural war. I'll fight it tooth and nail. I'll fight it no matter what the social or public consequences are. You know, you already know that the social consequences, that the inner party consequences, the external consequences, they don't scare me. Whether it's you know people calling for my resignation because I simply will not say that it's good to be a soldier, or whether it's people calling for my resignation when I say that government should not be making sexual decisions, or whether it's people calling for my resignation because I say that being a government school teacher is morally wrong, whatever the reason is, I have shown that I will not back down from those, and that above anyone else who's running, I know how to turn my issues into the center of discussion for a large group of people. Yeah, the to the culture argument, you just look at the primaries between the Republicans and Democrats. I mean, they gave us the craziest people they could have given us. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's we get a chance every four years to do it differently, and we never do it differently. So it's it's definitely something we're focused on in the culture war. Uh, I will I will take an aside here sure. just to say I know I uh, I was one of the ones who called for your resignation uh, oh, good. in the past. I regret it. I I was upset with your messaging and still the way you said it. And you even apologized or said, I should have said that differently or or something like that. But I just was so like, oh, we, I I wanted to be seen. I'm still, you know, for me, messaging is, is so key. I think especially as a member of the media, I just want to get it out there and bring as many people as we can into the fold of getting against the authoritarian message. And I just said, this is the type of messaging that's going to scare people off. But the more I have distanced myself from that exact situation and that decision, I just said, you know what, I, I, maybe I can disagree with his decision, but that doesn't mean kicking people out, asking people to resign, trying to, trying to keep them down. I just figure if you're listening to this podcast and you're like, I know that Hody guy hates that kid. What's he, what's going on here? <laughs> That's, that is no longer the case. I, uh, I, I have come to terms with it. I, I totally understand where you were coming from. I would have said it differently. I think you might've said things differently, but Some of them, yeah. I mean, as, 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 as you mentioned, there were things where I said something that, that I thought would be funny and I was like, well, it's not funny. It's just kind of a stupid joke. And I, and I took, you know, if I say something that I think is wrong and I do sometimes, I either just take it down immediately if no one's really seen it or if people have seen it, I apologize immediately for it. Um, that's happened a couple of times. You know, it's, it's happened maybe once or twice. I got a lot of publicity, but it's happened a few times where, where I put up something or shared something that, you know, maybe I thought was kind of funny, mm-hmm. but you know, later on having realized, you know, really the, the impact of it, 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 it's not a fight worth having. Uh, when it comes to things like, you know, you know, whether or not you should be joining the military, that to me is a fight worth having. Yeah. Because when I see the Libertarian Party turn just like the NFL into a military recruiting organization, to me, that is not something that I'm willing to let buy and watch happen. That to me is not okay. And so in that case, I'm not going to back down. If I say something stupid, I'm just gonna back down and just say, yes, sorry, I should, shouldn't have said it if, if it is the wrong thing to have said. Sure. It's, uh, I have said things, I think everybody knows what it's like to say something and regret it. And so mm-hmm. I think for me, I'm happy to still have my job here at We're Libertarians <laughs> and still have said things that I were like, oh, if I could do that episode again, I'd do that episode again. You know, we, we listen mm-hmm. to ourselves, those of us who have had podcasts from six years ago and just kind of say, I don't even think that stuff anymore. I wouldn't have said that at all. I've learned so much more since then. So I just figured I would address that. I'm, I'm not trying to throw you a curveball because I know I promised no curveballs in this one. I just figured I'd, I'd say that for the audience's sake. I actually thought when you promised no curveballs, I was like, yeah, there's definitely going to be some curveballs. No, 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 no. None of that. None of that. We're just, I, I'm only bringing that up just so that people understand kind of where, where if they know the relationship between you and I and, and sure. they wonder what's, what's going on in my head. Uh, as of right now, I've not, I, I am completely open on the libertarian field. I'm loving these interviews so far because it's just given me, and maybe I'm even doing it for myself more than my viewers. Who knows? We'll see what happens. But I just really, I've loved to hear everybody's perspective because it's kind of created some clarity as far as the directions that I might go when I endorse mm-hmm. somebody. Um, but you are, I, I guess you should know you are definitely still in the running it's not like one of those guys where it's like there's no way i'm gonna do this but i gotta interview him anyway because it's my job you know um okay let's talk about the the moderates the minarchists i know you talked about your messaging kind of gearing towards them traditionally they're the ones who actually show up to the convention they're the they're the majority of the delegates 
the majority of them are very, very small government. These are the same guys that, and forgive me for presuming, but probably would have given us Bill Weld. They gave us Gary Johnson. They've given us Bob Barr. You know, mm -hmm. these are the, the change comes in a suit people. How do you make your messaging suitable to them, especially because they're the, probably the biggest, I guess, hurdle for more, most candidates in order to get into that, that, that presidential status? Sure, sure. Um, I'm going to address that in, from a few different angles. One is a philosophical angle. The, there are, there's a difference between a minarchist and somebody who's just not a libertarian at all. So, for example, minarchists do believe in government courts and they do not believe in government schools. That's a minarchist. Mm -hmm. If you do believe in government schools, you're not a minarchist. You're, you're just somebody who has some views, but those aren't minarchist views. If you're a classical liberal, you still don't believe in government schools. If you don't believe me, look it up on what, whatever your preferred method of looking things up, what a minarchist <laughs> is, what a classical liberal is doesn't involve things like government schools. It does involve things like, like the government running a court. It's those who have seen my public, you know, my, you know, my major media addresses uh, or major media interviews, I should say, I speak from an anarchist perspective because I want to speak our views from an area that we all can agree on, that, that all of us who are here in good faith as good faith libertarians, mm -hmm. either minarchists or anarchists can agree on. Minarchists and anarchists are going to disagree on whether or not government should be involved in courts. I personally don't think so. And I've you know, spoken a lot about how you know, most of us don't go to government courts. We call our credit card companies if we have a dispute. You know, th those type of things, those are interesting things to talk about to libertarians. But when I'm, you know, when I'm talking to the, to the media about, you know, to, to the, the broad stream media, I speak from a minarchistic perspective. That to me is is the role of a representative. Um, now, there are people who, who aren't, ex it, it's not that they're minarchists in a, in a policy sense. When they say they're minarchists, what they mean is they want someone with a nice resume. I don't think that resumes are that important. However, if resumes are very important to you, I do have a pretty good one. I graduated from an Ivy League school in math. I've started my own business. I'm an internationally published author. I've been on media, not just discussing politics, but also discussing education. I have a track record that is respectable. I don't think it matters. I don't think it has anything to do with anything. But those who are looking for a resume rather than principles, I can offer both. I think my principles are more important and, in my opinion, more impressive than my resume. But I do have a resume. Um, when it comes to the way, what another issue that minarchists often have is that they want their representatives to dress in a way in sort of standard business attire. You know, I've run a business for a long time. I've been the vice chair of the party for two terms. Uh, before that, I was representative at large. You know, I, I, when I'm doing politics, when I'm doing business, I dress according to the needs. If I don't think it's that important, I think principles matter and the kind of clothes you wear don't. But if they matter to you, you're not going to be disappointed with my wardrobe. But what it really comes down to is this. I don't think that minarchists are like sort of just dumb, hidebound people. I think most minarchists are open to exciting ideas. They've already come halfway. So many of them want someone who's going to get up there and really fight for their causes that are going to actually make the cultural changes that they want. And I'm that type of person. I'm not going to be pulling punches. I'm not another Gary Johnson who's going to basically make sure that none of his policies are known to anyone. I will make libertarian policies, libertarian ideas, the center of American political discussion, as I've done with many issues in the past in the libertarian movement. If you thought that was a big group talking about something, just give me the nomination and I'll show you what it really looks like when you make a big group of people focus on something controversial. If you want to know what they're going to be focusing on, they're going to be focusing on pardoning jury nullification, abolishing government schools, Bitcoin, and ending the income tax. Great. And, and I got to say, I vouch for Arvin on the suit. You can find him anywhere. He looks great. He look, if, you're, if you're listening to this on Spotify or iTunes, uh, flip it on over to our YouTube or wearelibertarians.com because you can actually see Arvin in his full glory. He looks <laughs> fantastic, and he always does. Uh, d does just great there. Um, so let's let's 
talk about the nuts and bolts of a campaign. Sure. I've worked on a presidential campaign before. They're long, they're tedious. And the president, the president themselves or the presidential candidate spends 90% of their time fundraising. Mm-hmm. 7%, 8% of the time talking to people or at some big convention making a speech and the other 2% of the time like sleeping. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a rough life and it's something you need a plan for. Do you have a plan in place? If so, what's your, what is kind of your plan? What's your structure there? Sure. Uh, my plan has been, and this is a plan that's been going on for several years now. I want to give you an example of the scope of things that I've already done as part of this plan. I knew that if I was going to run for president, I would need to be mobile. One of the things that I did is I went through a very complex process of moving my entirely in-person education business into an entirely online education business. Those who work in education can probably tell you how difficult that is. That is something that I've already done in preparation for this. So I've made it made sure that I'll be able to be anywhere in the country that has a reasonable-ish internet connection. If I'm somewhere with an internet connection, I'm going to be able to do that. I've also trained uh, my staff to take over from me. So even if I'm gone for months at a time, my business can run without me physically being there. And so depending on how heated things get, um, you know, that's going to be there. Within the campaign, though, there's going to be a one very important difference between my campaign and the Johnson campaign in terms of logistics. The Johnson campaign did a lot of logistics well, and they did some of them poorly, especially when it came to media issues. Often, media, major media outlets would end up through desperation contacting just as me, just because I was somebody who, who was vaguely connected to the Libertarian Party and therefore maybe indirectly connected to the Gary Johnson campaign. We're talking about significant media, the Young Turks that wanted to just follow them around and really just make them the center of their, of their, of their podcast for you know, a few days or whatever, Voice of America. I mean, these are people that the campaign didn't get back to, did not even reply with a no, let alone with a, with a yes. The way that my campaign structure is designed is we're gonna make sure that we are actively getting, well, at the very least, responding to the media requests that come in. Yeah. We have an excellent plan, uh, it may be a little bit tedious, but it's, it's a well-designed, logistically well-designed plan to do media outreach uh, and all that kind of stuff. When it comes Nobody, to fundraising, yeah. uh, I think that I have the beginnings of a pretty solid fundraising team. I know that if I get the nomination, you're gonna have more people who are gonna come into that. Even right now though, fundraising is something that I've done before as part as, as the Libertarian Party Vice Chair. I've experienced with it. I've done it through both, whether it's working with major donors or if it's you know, the kind of more grassroots type fundraising. As a simple example of the, of the lab, the former talking with big donors, I think people get what that's like. Uh, in terms of the grassroots fundraising, uh, when I was a representative at large, this was during the Sandy Hook shooting, I was the one that spearheaded the fundraising towards having uh, YouTube and radio advertisements that were about getting rid of gun-free school zones at that point. This is while the NRA was basically silent, the Republicans were saying nothing. We were the only ones doing anything. And that's an example, if you wanna like look back in the archives of, 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 of a kind of more grassroots fundraising approach. Yeah. I'm ready to do either kind. I have experience with both kinds. And, and I do think that as, as a businessman, my experience with logistics at the very least is something that's going to come in quite handy. Great. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of times with, with libertarians, we shut up when we shouldn't shut up, if that makes sense. There's times when we say, oh, well, this is time that we need to kind of be quiet about our values. And, and Sandy Hook was a perfect example where I said, no, this is like the reason. This is like the reason we have these values. Uh, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, very last question. Okay. Uh, if, if people are interested in your campaign, interested in you, want to talk to you, love you, hate you, want to volunteer, want mm-hmm. to talk smack about you, where's the right place? Where's the right place? to? <laughs> My website is votevora.com. That's wow. V-O-T-E, like, you know, you're voting for president. Mm-hmm. And my last name is spelled V as in Victor, O-H-R-A. That's votevora.com. Votevora.com, great. Arvin, thank you so much for making the time uh, to come onto the show. I really appreciate it. I, I will be sure, I'm running through this with all the candidates that, mm-hmm really reply or accept my uh, accept the offer and 
Uh, we'll be opening this back up again. We'll be doing uh, we'll be doing other episodes that will have curveball questions that I won't give you beforehand. And <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm looking forward to those. Yeah, people can see exactly how well you think on your toes, um, and, and uh, as well as debates between candidates as well. Um, mm-hmm. We're just running through this first so that everybody kind of gets a baseline at who these guys are, and then we can see how they go head to head in the playoffs. Uh, but I really appreciate you uh, taking the time and coming out here. Uh, do you have any last words for the audience? Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate what, appreciate what you're doing. And the simple thing, what you're doing right now is the number one thing we need to be doing, which is we create our own infrastructure with you. We are creating our own media. You are creating the libertarian media. That's going to make a huge difference in 2020. Awesome. Thank you so much, Arvin. And if you enjoyed this podcast, uh, help us keep it going. Join our Patreon. Uh, get the benefits there. Uh, Visit us on Facebook. Share our media. We're not even asking for your money. Just spread this around to your friends. If you heard something that you like or didn't like, throw it on Facebook. All attention is good attention as far as I'm concerned. We'd love to hear from you. love to hear what you think about. And we're just really interested in the conversation. So again, uh, Arvind Vora, thank you. We're Libertarians signing off. We really appreciate you listening.